Welcome to Fernway Insights, where prominent leaders and influencers shaping the industrial and industrial tech sector discuss topics that are critical for executives, boards, and investors. Fernway Insights is brought to you by Fernway Group, a firm focused on working with industrial companies to make them unrivaled segment of one leaders. To learn more about Fernway Group, please visit our website at fernway.com. Hi, this is Nick Santanam, CEO of Fernway Group. Welcome to our next edition of Fernway Insights podcast. Today, our guest is Mr. Bob Luddy, founder and president of Captive Air Systems. A graduate of LaSalle University and a U.S. Army veteran, Bob's journey has been fascinating. He grew up in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and has been entrepreneurially minded since he got his first job on a bread delivery truck at age 11. After attending college and opening a fiberglass manufacturing business, serving in Vietnam and starting a family, he founded Captive Air in 1976 with $1,300 of capital, all of his money. Today, Captive Air is a leading manufacturer of commercial air, commercial kitchen ventilation equipment, and a manufacturer of commercial HVAC equipment as well. The company has over 1,000 employees, 90 sales offices in the U.S. and sales north of $500 million. However, Bob is more than just a businessman. He's a champion for children's education and a school choice advocate. He's the founder and chairman of Franklin Academy, the St. Thomas More Academy, and the Thales Academy. In 2007, he was awarded the Ludwig von Mrs. Entrepreneurship Award for entrepreneurial success and devotion to the free market ideal. He's also the author of the book, Entrepreneurial Life, The Path from Startup to Market Leader, which we'll talk about later in the podcast today. So with that, Bob, welcome. We are excited to have you, and we're looking forward to having this conversation. Nick, it's a pleasure to be with you here today. Thank you, Bob. So let's start off by talking about Captive Air. Let's talk a little bit about what the company is and what it does. I think most people know, but it'll be great for the audience to get more color from you. Yeah, Captive Air is the manufacturer of commercial kitchen ventilation systems. And over the last 40 years, uh, commercial kitchens have become much more sophisticated, um, cleaner, cooler, nicer to work in. And we're also an emerging company in the HVAC business producing a new technology called DOAS, Direct Outside Air Systems, which provide heating, cooling, and uh, humidity control for any type of commercial building. So I would presume that this is a stable business. Obviously, you need uh, HVAC uh, and ventilation all the time. How has COVID impacted your business, Bob, both from opportunities and challenges? Well, initially, uh, COVID impacted us with uh, a a small sales decline, maybe in the 10% range. Um, we were able to keep our factories uh, working continuously, so they didn't have a, a huge impact. So near term in uh, 2020, we had a sales loss. But then as we moved into uh, 21, sales began to pick up. And by the end of 21, we had the highest sales gain in the history of the company. So our sales gains were over 50%. So COVID was two extremes. Uh, slow and ultra fast. Um, we did have some challenges in 21 related to hiring employees. We were able to work through that and we're now at all time peak, pro- peak production. So typically when uh, adversity strikes captive air, near term, we have some problems to work through. Longer term, we always end up as a stronger company. So Bob, Let's talk about this, right? As you said, you sort of had a sales drop and now you have an all-time sales increase. I mean, two extremes, two ends of the extremes. What have you done to address these? And I'm going to call both of them a challenges, right? I mean, obviously when revenues drop, it's bad, but when also revenue goes up like this, it's you have to manage the supply chain, the labor market, the incentives. Can you talk a little bit about how did you manage the two extremes of challenges? And, uh, two things that may be instructive. So we decided in April of 2021, 
we would pay the price necessary to keep steel and components coming in the door. And that included going to Taiwan to buy stainless steel, uh, to paying premiums for components coming in the door, which means our gross profit's gonna drop near term, but we're gonna be able to serve our customer. The second thing that we did was, uh, as these orders ramped up so rapidly, we asked all of our R&D and engineers to, to go back into the plant and actually physically work and lead. And it's kind of interesting to see uh, when these engineers come in the plant, they have enthusiasm, they have ideas, they wanna fix things. And the, the production workers love it because it's like, we have all this assistance coming in here and everybody on our team can do this work. And, and the whole process actually worked quite well. So we were able to jumpstart production and meet the needs, even though our lead times now are longer than they've been in the history of the company. Uh, we still can squeeze orders and move things around to satisfy our customers. So we, we react in real time and we do what is necessary to keep that manufacturing plan humming. Very interesting. Bob, maybe we'll talk a little bit even without the COVID context. I mean, when you and I met, you were talking about the big changes happening in the commercial food services sector, right? And obviously, COVID has accelerated a lot of them. For example, the emergence of new models like ghost kitchens, new delivery platforms like DoorDash and Uber Eats, increasing demand for technology solutions like remote monitoring, remote maintenance, and the list goes on. I'm sure you'll add five more, which I don't know. How are these disruptions? and maybe I should not even use the word disruption, but I'll use it. How are these disruptions impacting both the sector, but also captive air in particular? When, if you went back, uh, when we started in the HVAC industry, you had a, a large number of manufacturers supplying components and uh, professional engineers would put these together and mechanical contractors. But many times they were not fully compatible and there is also what we call dynamic effects. So everything does what it's intended to do. When you put them all in one building, uh, you get some unusual outcomes. So gradually over a 40 year period, what we decided to do was to be a full integrator, which means we make every product related to the HVAC, the, the delivery systems, the kitchen ventilation, the controls, the monitoring of these devices. So as a new challenge comes along, we look at that total building and we design a system that's going to meet the intended needs. Whereas uh, in the past and even today, you have people that can do a portion of that job. That makes it way more complicated, particularly for new industries that don't have experiences and maybe don't know exactly what they need. So the short answer is full integration, 100% responsibility for the outcome and continuity for as long as that building exists in terms of service and support. So, Bob, you've been in this industry since 76, and as you said, you've always been leading the changes and you've been driving the changes. Um, so maybe this will be an easy question for you. As you look into the crystal ball, what are your top three predictions or one prediction for this segment, uh, how this will evolve over the next five years? Well, one is if you look at these, uh, we'll call them component manufacturers, whereas they've been able to survive in the past uh, with integration. Uh, first of all, these components tend to be over time, components and or technologies, they're moving toward obsolescence. So what I see in the future is companies that understand the leading edge technology and are full integrators and take 100% responsibility for what they're doing uh, will win. If you think of the iPhone, how many technologies disappeared because of the iPhone? Well, if you look at HVAC industry, many of these manufacturers' uh, products will no longer be needed based on new technologies. Uh, and it's the primary reason why Captive Air over the years has always looked to be on the leading edge, because otherwise you're moving toward obsolescence and um, possibly going out of business. Fascinating. So Bob, now I want to take a little bit of a detour or a little bit of a change and talk about your journey to date. Uh, you've had a fascinating story. Um, 
tell us about your journey of founding Captivare in 1976 as an installer of fire suppression systems mm-hmm. and then making the change, making the evolution now to being the leading manufacturer of commercial kitchen ventilation systems. I mean, I think anybody and everybody, wherever they turn around, they see Captivare's logo in any of these large installation systems. Tell us how you made the journey. What was the journey like? One of the things that, that I thought early on is to recognize that I didn't have the skills to run a, a larger company and that I would have to develop those skills on a daily basis and that the company would have to grow both in technology and capabilities on a continuous basis. So we deployed the idea of uh, Kaizen, continuous improvement. I also, um, and this would be fits and starts, I tried to convince the employees, we're always running on the bell lap. So we're running as hard as we can go all the time. And for some people, that's not what they want to do, but that's what Captive Air does. Uh, so every time we made an advance, we look for the next advance. And think about a company growing as compound interest. At times, it seems to be moving slowly, but over a 40-year period, you can accomplish a lot. But you have to have that growth mentality. We have a fanatical focus on the end user. Uh, we're our own worst critics. If we have a technology that's good but not perfect, we're dissatisfied with it. We're looking for a better technology. And that process took a long time for various reasons. You have industry people to slow you down. You have code requirements. You have laws. You have everything essentially tries to create inertia. And, and very often markets are they're satisfied with inertia. And it takes the power to overcome that inertia. So captive air is that power. And it, uh, it almost relates to the laws of physics, the way we operate. So, Bob, let me actually ask a follow-up question, right? As you said, inertia is comforting, right? I mean, what you did yesterday, you can do today. It feels good. Why don't you like inertia? Why do you say keep changing? I mean, I get the I like the end product, but changing inertia is really hard. How do you get yourself, your team, your broader team to say, what I did yesterday was not good enough, and today I have to do completely something different? Um, we built that culture over time. For myself personally, I'm never satisfied unless it's perfect. And I could look back in the 80s and the 90s, and I could always list these imperfections. So I'll give you an example. In 2002, we had a young engineer, Bill Griffin, who's now the president of Captive Air Manufacturing. And I wrote a list of 10 things that I didn't like about the commercial cooking hoods we were producing. He added three more items on that. And I said, it's our job to correct every single one of those items in the next design. It took us two years to to roll it out, and we corrected 12 of 13. For technical reasons, one of the issues we couldn't resolve, but we didn't throw it out. Five years later, we resolved that issue with higher tolerancing equipment and a slightly different approach. So the second thing is, I said to Bill uh, some years after that, every three to four years, are you willing to take the products you design with your team? and take a critical look at them to find out if there's anything we could do better. He said, absolutely, I'll join you all anytime you wanna do that. So we have this process of self-criticizing and essentially we're never, we're never satisfied with ourselves. And, that, and that's what gives us that push. So we always think like, I'm deficient, I have to do something about it. My products are deficient, I don't want them to be deficient. Even little things, if you look at the doors on our HVAC units, they're 10x what industry doors are. They're insulated, they're quiet, they come off and on. Uh, They don't don't have any fasteners to open, you just open them with a handle. Uh, That's something that we dreamed about. It took us maybe three or four years to get it resolved. But for the technician working on that product, it's a great joy. And to us, it's a great satisfaction that we can bring that quality level to the market. So, Bob, just building on that furthermore, how do you get that balance between being perfect, right, versus getting a product out to the market, which the customer can use and then give you feedback to make it perfect, right? Because as they say, the perfection is the enemy of good. uh, And sometimes a lot of people start doing it, but they never get to the end line. We use the uh, physics theory of diminishing returns. 
we know that you can never achieve absolute perfection, but we're always pushing toward perfection. And there comes a point in time with a product, this is the absolute best we can do at this point in time. Three to five years from now, we may be able to do a better job due to new technologies, new thinking on our part. Uh, I have a physicist friend of mine, that's uh, Dr. Bejan at Duke University. And he says that evolution is pushed forward with sparking, with pushing, with new ideas. But at a given point in time, if we've done everything we know how to do, we don't have that sparking. We've, we've exhausted all the sparking we have, but that will change in two to three years. So we're very defined as to the way we approach product design, product review, and uh, it's working quite well for us. <laughs> And I remember, and we'll come up to talk about your book, Bob. I mean, you have a quote in your book, right? Fail fast, fail cheap. And I think that also ties in very well, right? Because you're sort of learning, you're making mistakes, but once you know you made that mistake, move on so that you don't make the same mistake twice. Right. Uh, one of the things that I try to push is we, we continue to move forward despite chaos. So COVID is chaos. We're still moving forward. Our plants are going to be open. People are going to come into the office. We're going to serve our customers. We're not going to be slowed down by anything that happens in the world. So maybe the, the theory is you can either be in control of your own life and your own company or someone else is in control. And we don't want someone else to be in control or some event to be in control. <laughs> very true. Very true. So, Bob, tell us a little bit of what attracted you towards this industry, this business early on. I mean, obviously, you're an Army veteran. You started out, I'm going to say, in a non-HVAC, non-ventilation sort side of the business, what made you believe that you could transform this into what it is today? When I started installing um, fire suppression systems into commercial kitchen ventilation systems, the thing I immediately noticed is the process was slow, it was arduous, and the outcome was rarely great. Uh, it, may, it may have been accidentally acceptable, but very often the um, kitchen ventilation systems didn't work well. So you had Affluence going into the kitchen. Kitchens were hot and uncomfortable. You had negative pressure in the buildings. So I began to write these things down. And very early on, um, back in late 77, I felt confident that we could do a better job than the industry and we could integrate over time. Now, the challenges were formidable, but doable. And this is probably a thing you can have a pie, you can have an entrepreneur who's got pie in the sky and approaches something that cannot be done. That's a waste of time. So, in this case, obviously, over time with the right technologies, I knew we could make vast improvements. So, staying with that process for a long period of time is what made it happen. Most people at some point in time become satisfied with themselves or what they're doing, and then they don't grow any longer. If you look at our top engineers, we're always dissatisfied with what we're doing all the time. <laughs> and that dissatisfaction leads to that sparking and discussion and, and forward movement. Amazing. So, Bob, you're obviously the CEO, the founder of, of Captive Air. This is a company very well known where customers are all praised for the company's product quality, service, lead times. Uh, but this is not the only thing you do. You're also passionate about education. Um, tell us more about the work in that space. So not, nothing to do with heating and ventilation, now about educating young minds. When I was lucky to grow up, I went to Catholic school for 16 years. And without that, that education, there's no way I could be where I'm at today. So our family had a very high value of education. So one of the things we noticed uh, with operating the plants, many of these individuals were intelligent, they were good people, but they lacked the education they needed. And as a result, they uh, struggled with their, their job, but also they struggled within their families. So in 1998, I opened a charter school. And my thought was, the schools are so bad that it would be impossible for me to be worse than them. <laughs> so the bar was pretty low. And um, one of the things I did, I heard some pretty good teachers create a spirit of core and said, look, 
we're going to educate every one of these students. We're going to care about them like they were our own children. And so we opened up year one with about 160 students. And charter schools were unknown in North Carolina in 1998. But people saw there might be something better here, and they moved toward it. Also, since I had already a reputation in the community, that, that helped jumpstart the school. And so over time, I used the exact same process where teachers feel like, well, we're doing, aren't we doing enough for you? And I said, you're never doing enough for me. I'm going to push, push, push to get a better outcome. And as a result, over these uh, last uh, 20 years, these schools have improved dramatically. Uh, we have some amazing students coming out of our schools. They're becoming more and more well-known. And the other thing that we're trying to do and are doing is huge impact on families, on communities, on the way people think about education. Fascinating. That's fascinating, Bob. Education and HVAC, uh, two even important topics. Um, I'd like to switch topics now, Bob. At Fernway, as you know, we continue to see a lot of small businesses, especially family-owned business that struggle with driving growth and profitability in a sustainable way. Um, what would your advice be to such companies based on your experience on Captive Air? I mean, obviously, as you said, you started in 1976. Today, it's north of 500 million, growing, doing very well. But unfortunately, that's not the case for a lot of private family-owned companies, smaller companies, right? They grow, then they plateau out uh, at some number, pick a number. What would your advice be? You know, if I look at companies that I know of and founders that I know, they continue to grow and they, they do their own thinking. So you can hire lawyers and you can hire financial people and you can have board of directors and you can have all this stuff, but that's really not going to make the company continuously grow. So individuals have to develop their personal capacity and they have to develop capacity among uh, the people that they hire to continuously move to higher levels. Otherwise they flounder, maybe they have too many family members, maybe they take too many vacations. You know, I know entrepreneurs that I've known several that as soon as they start making some money, they take more vacations, they pay less attention to the business and all of a sudden the business is floundering. So if you're gonna run a business, it's, it takes uh, tremendous dedication, but you have to run the business. Nobody else can run that business for you. You have to develop your own philosophy and your own level of thinking. I just met with a gentleman who's probably my age and has created just a tremendous business. And in an hour, you can quickly see why he's so successful. He's thinking, he's growing, he's learning, and he's not encumbered by all the things you might learn in B-School or what you might hear on the news. They're, they are independent thinkers who seek the truth and eventually find the best answers. Bob, maybe switching slightly related to that, right? Um, access to the right talent and capacity and capability is a big challenge these days. I mean, you hear about the labor market being hot, but more important or more pertinent is, if, especially when you look at the U.S. industrial base, uh, manufacturing base, there is an amazing shortage of talent. Um, what have you done to, one, get the talent to your company and grow them? And what, what is the learnings you can share with us about that? You know, I think if you look at all the senior people here, every one of us is a teacher. So we spend an enormous amount of time trying to teach and develop our people. Uh, we had a meeting yesterday with HR, and the, the, the topic was this. How can we make that experience of working in our manufacturing plants better for that individual and better for their families, whether it's health care, we provide them with shirts and shoes, uh, we have a weekly uh, luncheon provided to all employees in the company, all the manufacturing plants. Um, we, we try to give them a fair number of days off. If they don't use their days off, we buy them out. Uh, we try to maintain a lot of flexibility. At the same time, we require a high level of discipline. You have to come to work every day. You have to be on time. You have to have an uh, orientation toward quality. And individuals like being in an environment that's productive, where they are perceived to be treated fairly, where people will listen to their ideas, even if they're not enacted, they're listened to and considered, and where senior management can walk around the plant and talk and know their names and talk to them. 
and hear their concerns. Um, all those things are really important in the long term, as opposed to just go in your corner and make something and uh, follow the rules. Uh, where it's not a pleasant environment to be in. Uh, we also have, since since we're in the clean air business, all of our plants now have DOAS units, so they have a continuous flow of outside air. We keep the plants neat, clean, orderly, well lit, uh, nice lunch rooms. So we're doing everything we know how to do, and we will continue to improve that experience over time. Fascinating. Um, Another thing that we've observed, Bob, with fam especially family-owned businesses, is that they take a lot of pride in their culture. Uh, however, it's not easy to sustain that culture over the years. How have you managed that at Captive Air? I mean, every time you talk, I can sense that culture of self-learning, growth, pride. I mean, the list goes on. How do you do that? I think working on spree de corps within the, and the culture is something we do continuously. We listen to people. I tell people that first come in the company, I do presentations to them. If you're frustrated, send me an email, tell me why. We'll do something about it. Um, speaking to them, no hierarchy. Okay, that's, that's one thing. Okay, any of us at the top level, matter of fact, this, this happens periodically. So there'll be a problem on Sunday morning or Saturday night. Who's on that? Our top people are, are getting it. Uh, some other people may be on vacation or not available. We're going to be available. We're going to do it. So we prove to them we're willing to do anything. We're willing to go into plant and work. We'll go on sales calls. We'll go on roosts. We'll handle customer problems. That builds the spirit of core that our organization is very flat. We're all engaged in servicing the customers. And individuals they are going to have the greatest satisfaction from serving their customer. When you have a great outcome, there's no greater experience in your lifetime, or you make a beautiful, high quality product. Our, our production employees are very proud of that. So doing is, it has to be continuous. You can never let up. So if you're sleeping for a year, you're losing. You gotta be paying attention and improving, or, or you're actually, you're going backwards is essentially. You may not realize it. So this mentality of continuous growth has to be on your mind at all times. Interesting, very interesting. So Bob, as you know, at Fernbay, we see there's a big gap in the trade skills in the US. Uh, you know, electrician, plumbers, you name on. And so we have actually, we have launched an effort to bring a bunch of individuals, bring up senior executives, companies together to close this trade gap, uh, trade skills gap in the US through training programs, you know, both addressing the demand and supply so that over time, the supply demand imbalance can be uh, closed. You've always had a deep interest in education. Any advice you'll tell us on how do we make these training programs or not even training programs, right? This effort better so that, you know, two years from now, Bob, and you and I are talking, I can say, you know what, Bob, we launched this effort and we have trained 100,000 electricians, 200,000 plumbers, 300,000 roofers, and now we really have all the talent we need in the U.S. to have a very uh, sustainable, vibrant industrial community that we didn't have or which we started to develop three years ago. Yeah, I think that for too long, companies have looked to the government to take, take care of this process. So government's pretty much thrown out vocational education, so they're obviously not doing that. There's Certain things you can learn uh, disciplines in school, in the classroom. You can learn math. You can learn something about physics, et cetera. But specifically, whatever that company does, it's better to learn on the job. Uh, we've, we've been through these ideas of they can go to the community college and they can learn this stuff and then come into the plant. It's never worked for us. Um, think about if you wanted to lay bricks, would you go to the community college or would you go work with a professional bricklayer? Uh, if you were working with a really good bricklayer, in pretty short order, you'd begin to learn the trade. So the specifics of any company have to be learned on the job. And companies have a very high incentive to develop those individuals. Where someone in, in a community college or any school, they're just going through the motions. It may be abstract, et cetera. So I think that two things. I would send them to school to learn some basic disciplines 
But then I would take it on as an industry. I would take that challenge on uh, internally and not expect anybody else to do it. Because I think if you expect someone else to do it, you're going to be very disappointed, particularly in this market. So, Bob, I want to, uh, this is a fascinating journey, fascinating thoughts. So thanks for your time. But I want to sort of close off by asking not about the company you run, not talking about the schools you've started, but about the book you wrote, uh, Entrepreneurial Life, The Path from Startup to Market Leader. You know, given your experience, given your journey, it was a great idea to pen it down. But obviously, writing a book takes a lot of time, <laughs> takes a lot of effort. And usually that's not the first thing I would, say, most CEOs or entrepreneurs say, that's what we're going to do. Tell us about how, what got you motivated to write the book. My mentor was Dr. Bill Peterson, who was an Austrian economist. He was both a colleague and student of Ludwig von Mises at NYU in New York. So we had this relationship over a 20-year period where he taught me economics. But free market economists love entrepreneurs and vice versa. Uh, they're, they're just... They're, they're paired perfectly. So Bill Peterson encouraged me to write the book and uh, he, he helped me uh, do, do some edits. Uh, during the process, he actually died, but I have to give him credit and, and credit's actually in the start of the book there. Yep. Um, what I did was work on it on the weekend. So Saturday morning, I'd get up early and I'd work on it. Uh, it ended up taking longer than I thought because I had so many editors helping me. It slowed down the process. So one thing I learned was editors uh, can be challenged from a technical standpoint. So they understand the language, but they don't understand the technology. And they, they may not understand that entrepreneurs think entirely different than other people. Uh, so something they may say, uh, they may be written down, they think is wrong, is actually exactly what that entrepreneur is thinking. So those are the things that I learned. And if I had to write a future book, I think I could do it quicker and more efficiently. And I certainly intend to do that. So, Bob, that was going to be my last question. You stole a little bit of my thunder. What's your, la what's your next book going to be about? It's going to be about all the things you, you must know and probably did not learn in school. <laughs> Something <laughs> along those lines. <laughs> and maybe you learned a little bit, but for example... Some things are very, very important. This idea of Kaizen, continuous growth, the idea of sparking and evolution, moving quicker, the idea of the fact that you have an education, that's great. It's a starting point. It's not an ending point. People will give lip service to that, but most people don't do much beyond that point in time. Yeah. The really good people are very effective learners. They're continuously learning. They're willing to accept criticism. I actually encourage people to criticize me, uh, anything that I do, because that's how I learn. And I look at these individuals as angels, because they provided me with some information or knowledge I didn't have. Um, so all those things take a certain amount of humility and purpose in life. So my purpose is to serve, to grow, uh, to have a, the, the largest contribution I can. And th that's my joy of life. That's what I like to do. With that, we'll wrap up this podcast. Thank you, Bob. Thank you for your time. This was extremely helpful, extremely insightful. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you. It was a pleasure to be with you today. Thanks for listening to Fernway Insights. Please visit Fernway.com for more podcasts, publications, and events on developments shaping the industrial and industrial tech sector.